Hello, and welcome to this um, presentation on COVID-19. My name is Douglas Deutschman. I'm a professor in uh, biology and statistics. This is the second of what I hope to be a series of uh, presentations and videos about the spread of this disease um, and uh, consequences throughout North America, Europe, and the world. Uh, my plan had been when I built this slide to talk about the U.S. and Canada today. I spent some time talking about predictions from Europe yesterday. I really haven't had time to do the predictions in Canada yet. So today is really going to focus on the U.S. and I'll work on Canada um, later today. Well, there's not much time left in today or tomorrow. Um, for Canada, I'll be looking at the overall rates in the country, but also particularly at uh, two um, highest uh, provinces where the disease has been more prevalent. That would be Ontario and British Columbia. This is something I posted with my first video. It's a public service announcement that I received on my phone yesterday uh, saying that restaurants are being shut down and gatherings less than of more than 50 people are no longer allowed and so forth. It's part of a public health strategy to slow down the spread of the disease. This is happening all over the U.S. and Canada and has been happening for some time uh, in Europe and before that in, in China and perhaps in South Korea. In general, the concept is I take a current string of data the last 7 or 10 or 15 days and I fit a real, the mo statistical model to it, and then I predict where I think the relation, the number of confirmed cases will go uh, in the next week or two weeks. Right now, I've been focusing just on confirmed cases. I think I'll also start modeling the uh, fatality um, number of uh, individuals that die from this disease to reemphasize how important, how dangerous the disease is, and therefore how important it is to take these public health measures quite seriously. This is uh, from yesterday's video. I'm showing data from Italy uh, plotted in a logarithmic scale. Here, this is a log 10 scale where these gray dots are the actual observed number of cases. The two models I fit is a regression line in blue for the, all the uh, uh, 10 days in March at that point that I was using, predicting then the middle of March. And I also used to build a second model on the, on the last five days, uh, predicting uh, the next seven. The reason I use a shorter model in addition is that in some cases it looked like the rate of spread was changing and a shorter model might actually more accurately capture the, the rate at that time. Um, when we convert that back to the uh, regular scale, we see that this is actually a very elegant, typical exponential spread. The data I'm using is down here on the lower left. Those are my predictions uh, in the red and blue line. And um, then I evaluated those yesterday uh, against the additional data that came in after I had fit those models. So same basic approach today. I'm going to be fitting some data, um, making predictions based on models, and then discussing the potential accuracy of those models and what might or might not uh, be reliable. Uh, we found yesterday that when we looked at Italy and Spain, and Portugal and France and Germany. Uh, I've also done Norway. I think I showed Norway, Austria, Switzerland, Iceland. I've done a, a number of countries, Greece. Um, and in general, the, the, the short-term predictions uh, about five to seven days out were actually pretty well captured by this simplistic but still effective uh, exponential model. So moving on to uh, the United States and Canada. Uh, before I started this video, according to the Johns Hopkins real-time uh, website data center. There were almost 200,000 confirmed cases total that have been reported worldwide and about 8,000 deaths, which means um, this is a really significant threat to all of us. So with the United States, I'm going to, instead of using shorter time periods, I'm going to use data up till yesterday, the 16th, and then predict out through the rest of March in two pieces, a short-term piece and a longer-term piece. On this graph, I've done something a little different than yesterday. I have the raw data again in gray circles. I have my two predictions in the red and blue. As before, the blue line is all of the data in March, and the red line is the more recent data in March. And because it looks like in the United States, the slope is, is changing a little bit. That is, the rate might be decelerating, maybe. Um, we have two different uh, predictions. Um, 
it looks very deceiving in, in the log scale, but I put on the scale this um, reminder that uh, on a log 10 scale, four means 10 to the fourth power, that's 10,000, five is 10 to the fifth power, 100,000, and two is 10 to the second power, 100. And so you can see that these are, are quite different. If we get to 10 to the sixth, we're at a million. So these two lines are making fairly different predictions, even though they don't look like it. So it's really important to transform back to the original metric. What we're looking at here is the short-term prediction. So I've got data through the 16th. I'm predicting to the 21st of March. And I would predict that uh, we have about 6,000 cases today. I would say in four or five days, we're going to have between 17 and 30,000 cases. Um, that's still a fairly broad range. It shows that the rate of change is, is variable enough, either because of true variation in transmission or testing or reporting, that it's uh, hard to get a, a really strong estimate. Those same two lines, if you extend them further uh, into time, continue to diverge because of the nature of compound interest or exponential growth. So if the blue line is, in fact, more accurate, more correct, we would predict at the end of the month, just two weeks away, to have uh, 750,000, three quarters of a million confirmed cases in the U.S. And if the much more uh, slow-growing model is more accurate, we'd expect uh, 250,000. Those are both huge numbers. Um, so it's important to, to see how this um, to pay attention to how this is spreading. But there's more to the story than that. Oh, look at that, my scan is complete, great. Um, there's tremendous variability between states. When I talk about Europe, I didn't say Europe is growing at X rate. I said, let's look at France and Italy and Germany. And we found that they were at different stages of this growth. Well, that's the same sort of pattern we're seeing in the United States. There's a couple states that have really high numbers. Uh, the two biggest are, are New York State and Washington State, the third being California. And then there's a patchwork of, of uh, states that have less and less cases. I think as of today, all 50 cases now have reported uh, confirmed uh, COVID-19. Um, I say that there's no reason to expect growth is to be is similar across all of the U.S. We have different population densities and different uh, regions, and so we would expect, in fact, that would be heterogeneous. So um, as of today, uh, well, yesterday, the 16th, I think, was the data I downloaded today on the 17th, there were almost 1,000 cases in both Washington and New York and about 500 cases in California. Those three states together represented about 53% uh, of the cases so far reported in the U.S. So those are the three current hotspots that we know about. I mentioned yesterday, and I'll mention again today, that we have done a terrible job in the U.S. testing, uh, and therefore these estimates are, are, I'm certain, a tremendous underestimate, and there may be other hotspots that we just haven't really documented well yet. So if we look at those, um, plotting the raw data now, we can see that uh, there's variability in the growth that we observe this. So the sort of smoothest curve we see in the raw data are these sort of dark gray or middle gray squares. Those are California. The circles are New York. So the circles start out lower than Washington over four or five days and then suddenly spike up over the state of Washington in the last few days. Washington has this weird pattern of in really sharp peaks and flattening areas, and that's likely testing and reporting, although it could be clusters of spread. It, it's really too soon to tell. Of these three, the one that looks like the most classic exponential is the California um, curve. But what would this look like a few days out or two weeks out in terms of predicted numbers? So uh, again, as we've done before, we put this in a log 10 um, scale so that we would expect a linear relationship if the actual relationship was exponential. This is just sort of a connect the dot graph. It's showing the observed number of cases and they're not perfectly straight. So when we fit a straight line to those data, we are making an assumption that, that it's a good fit and it's imperfect, but it's actually not too bad and it's a good place to start. So this is the, the linear models fit to those three states. And so I've got the three different uh, states plotted here, again, on the log scale. And then we have our three different predictions going out through the end of March. We see that there's some very big differences in the uh, predicted rate of spread. New York, which starts out here at the lowest values early in the month, 
and ends up um, growing very quickly, we would predict to have the highest number of cases at the end of the month. Washington State is intermediate, and then California looks like it's having the slowest accumulation of cases there. So we're going to look at those predictions one at a time and then sort of put them back together and see what they tell us and eventually compare it back to the aggregate number we're seeing from the states. So we have our three models. That other graphic was difficult to interpret because I had three different lines and it was challenging. So here I've got three individual panels with the best fit line, the regression line for each of the states. So we're now looking at California. And what we have in gray here is the actual data and then black is the prediction through the end of the month. So two weeks from today, I would predict if we continue this tra trajectory in California, we'll have 20,000 cases in California alone in two weeks. So we have 500 right now. That means we're going to be adding 10,000 cases a week for the next two weeks. Actually, it'll actually be slower at the beginning and faster toward the end, but 20,000 by the end of two weeks. And, and that's a lot of cases. Um, New York looks quite a bit different. The rate of spread is dramatically faster. And this is the, the full month model. And, and if you look at the relationship over here, you would probably fit a line that if you use only the last week of data, that is a little bit shallower. But uh, for now, I just wanted to make the point that we have heterogeneity and spread and that we need to understand that. So if we take this model as uh, a good model of data, which it's so-so, eh, we would predict that there's 1.3 million cases in New York State by March 31st. And that should set up a number of alarm bells, both biologically, what's going on disease-wise, but also mathematically. I talked a minute ago about the entire United States having maybe 500,000 or 750,000 cases um, at the end of March, and now all of a sudden a single state has 1.3 million cases. And I'll come back to this idea that sometimes the aggregate behavior doesn't tell you enough about what's going on and it can be misleading. So we'll return to that concept. For Washington, going to the third panel, Washington was uh, faster than California, but slower than New York so far. And we would predict at the end of uh, March that Washington state would have 77,000 cases. So um, California adding 20,000 cases is bad. Washington State having, adding 75,000 cases from their current total in two weeks is much worse. Uh, so the rate of spread could be really problematic in Washington. And, and if the model for New York is right, oh my gosh. Okay, so let's talk about that some more. How is it possible that one state can give us a prediction from a model of 1.3 million and then the entire United States can give us a model that predicts much less than that? When we take the entire aggregate data, we're putting together apples and oranges and some other fruits you want to pick, right? We have maybe very slow growth rate in Oklahoma or Alaska and very fast rate in New York and intermediate in California. We smoosh all that together and that aggregate behavior may be very different than the individual states. And the problem is that aggregate behavior may be a fiction in the sense that that's not the way the epidemic is spreading any one place. It's actually a sort of a, a hybrid, a hydra, some weird a mathematical duck. And we really want to look at the, the epidemic in New York, maybe not even New York State, maybe it's got to be in a smaller region um, because those areas where it's spreading quickly are going to end up being the ones that dominate the predictions later on. So if we have a couple of hotspots, those are the ones that are driving the number of cases up. And right now, New York State is a hot spot. So this estimate could be a dramatic underestimate if, in fact, the model for New York is, is reasonable, which I think it's, pr it's probably uh, an overestimate. But n nevertheless, uh, it's a point that we need to really make so that we understand and look carefully at not only the United States as a unit, but individual places within that. So what do I conclude? It's really too early to accurately predict the number of total cases observed in the U.S. by the end of March. That's partly because we have terrible, still uh, uh, low rates of testing. Um, taking the United States in aggregate is, is, is mixing together rural and urban areas and areas that got um, early infections and others that have just gotten them recently. And so that prediction may not make sense. If it did make sense, it would be, suggest we might have a half million cases at the end of March. If we look at New York as a potential example, we might think that's 
we're going to have more than a million or two million cases by uh, across the states uh, at that point. And if we looked at California as a model for the rest of the country, it might be quite a bit lower. So right now, it's hard to tell. The U.S. has done so little testing that we really can't um, put too much stock on these estimates yet. That will change over the next few days, I hope. But it, it doesn't matter. And I don't mean that because it's not important how many cases are. It's terribly important. What I mean is that of the three of them, California is growing the slowest. 20,000 cases in two weeks is an enormous public health crisis. And then we're going to have at least that kind of crisis in Washington and New York in the next two weeks. And then other states will be starting to have their own outbreaks. So uh, in, the best of, in the best of cases, the next two weeks are going to be rough and likely much worse beyond that. But specifics are very hard to, to be very confident right now. Uh, next steps, what am I going to be doing? I hope that I, by showing you real data and fitting simple models to those data, I can give us some sense of what might be coming. I'm going to be creating a presentation for the spread of the virus in Canada, again, in aggregate, which may or may not be very helpful. In Canada, there's really two hot spots, the provinces of Ontario and British Columbia. So we'll look at, at individual uh, models fit to those uh, provinces. Uh, I have some updated information from the European CDC and from Johns Hopkins and others about estimates of the severity of the disease as observed in Europe. So I'll be updating some information about the case fatality ratio as well as the, the rate of spread. Um, and I have recently downloaded some recent papers on the number of ICU beds in the U.S. and its capacity to accommodate, which is likely to be a crushing wave of people with severe respiratory problems. Um, as we've been hearing from in Italy, there's really no Western, there's no country in this in this world that's going to be able to handle uh, the number of uh, patients we need to see to treat for respiratory problems at the current rate of spread. So we really must slow it down. And I do think it's too late to avoid significant problems. That being said, it, it doesn't matter. We've lost some opportunities to slow this down. Um, this is a new virus. We're fumbling our way along through this. But we ha every day we act is better than waiting for another day. Every day we fail to act will be thousands of new cases that we'll be having trouble treating in a week or 10, week, 10 days or two weeks. So I'm um, leaving you with the parting thought, um, a little bit of humor just because we can't survive. I'm just a grim news alone. XKCD is a, a comic strip I love. It's a web comic. I think there's now a book and other things. And this is a comic recently uh, about the concept of the government act, act, acting, asking people to self-isolate. And uh, you know, experts are saying people need to self-isolate to combat the virus. This person's watching TV and then thinks to himself, I've been practicing for this moment my whole life. Quick, make plans and watch how fast I cancel. So that's amusing to me because I often spend a lot of time on my computer self-isolating. Turns out I was pre-adapted for handling uh, this epidemic. So a little levity at the end. Um, bringing us back to reality, we're going to hit 200,000 cases tonight. And um, the mortality rate in uh, Italy and uh, Germany and Spain and even in the States is quite high um, today. I think we've already uh, overtaken China in terms of the total number of deaths observed worldwide uh, in this epidemic. We now see more deaths in Europe than we saw in Hubei province. Um, and that's just going to keep accelerating for the near future. So uh, it's getting, getting worse before it gets better. I wish I had better news. And I will continue to try to tell you what I think is happening uh, so that uh, it can be one of the things you try to consider as you look at all the news on this disease.